And I say great PMs should be like Rocky Balboa. It's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. But I can tell you that the worst way of teaching PMs is about telling them the frameworks they should follow. And my dad told me once that no one is too good that has nothing to learn. And no one is too bad that has nothing to share. Three words, practice, practice, practice. But how do I practice is very important, not only the practice. And we need to be bold. And being bold means like, we need to play some bats and we we know that some of our bats are gonna fail. So I think, Janta, as people come keep coming in, I'll, they'll drop in and then more and more people come in. But before that, I just want to say the first thing even before I start, super grateful, David, for doing this. I think everybody knows you here already. So there isn't something that I need to do an introduction, but I'll still do whatever little I can. So I think the way the structure of the session is for the first 30 odd minutes, I'll do a quick two minute introduction of yours and then possibly ask you some questions that I want to learn from you personally. That, and then the remaining 30, 35 odd minutes, there are people, they have prepared questions, they've gone through your profile, they've understood the kind of work that you've done and I'll call people in the spotlight and they'll directly ask you questions that are regarding culture, product in general, your thesis as a book author and things like that, right? Make sense? Awesome. So, Janta, let me quickly do start with a brief set of introduction of a friend who needs no introduction, right? But let me do that for sure. <laughs> so, David is an ac accomplished product coach, a book author, and a keynote speaker. Currently, he serves as the chief executive officer at OMQ, OMQ Q, GmbH, where he identifies opportunity to innovate in the maritime as well as uh, industry and foster the culture of empowerment and accountability. Before stepping into the CEO role, David, David was the chief product officer at the same place, empowering team to bring their best and create valuable products that customers love. In addition to his role at OMOQ, uh, David is a Miroverse ambassador at Miro, uh, helping the product community drive value faster by providing templates that are simple to understand and ready to, use, ready to use. David's previous experience includes the head of product management at Virtual, Virtual Identity, where he was responsible for the continuous development of product management competencies. David's career has seen him in roles of a senior PM at Limango GmbH, a member of the auto group, where he scaled the marketplace revenue significantly. David also holds a MBA in entrepreneurship from the Holy Grail Babson College, right? That is there. And an and MBA in information technology from FIAP. His dedication to product management and his ability to transform user and consumer needs into simple, intuitive, and delightful products is truly inspiring. And you already know him from his product strategy cohorts and the things like that that he talks about, which are very, very to the point succinct topics. So I think, welcome, David. Thank you very much for gracing us here. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> David, so the first thing that I want to kind of talk about it is, and you've talked a lot about bullshit management, that people do a lot of bullshit ma management in the garb of product management. So I think the first question that I want to ask point blank is that who is a good operator? And here I'm consciously using the word who is an operator, where it which not necessarily means product manager. It can be a great engineering manager. It can be a great sales manager. And what are the core principles that you have seen shaped good operators? And they are like, I, I always understand that PMs don't have an archetype or they don't have a persona or a background, but this definitely have some kind of personal traits, which are very, very apparent when you try to hire someone or to have a conversation for a kind of a role. So what are those principles that have shaped you into youth, the operator that, that you are currently, and also you have seen in great operators? Sure. A few things that come to mind, curiosity, resilience, and drive. So PMs don't settle. PMs want to do things different. We want to do things better. And we are curious. We want to step into the unknown. When people are afraid, we want to go there and see what is happening. And one thing comes is we're going to hit the wall. There will be things that will happen and we'll say, ah. Oh. And that is when the re resilience is quite important. And I say great PMs should be like Rocky Balboa. It's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. This mindset will help people 
stand out among everyone else. Because if you want to stand out as a PM, the PM for you should not be just a job that is nine to five exchange time for money. It is a transformational job where you make things that apparently are impossible possible. You transform. So you need to have these characteristics, resilience, curiosity, and the drive. So I think I really want to deep dive into this thing that how, what do you mean by like, for example, a lot of people talk about empathy and things like that. What is resilience? Like, can you give an instance that, for example, this is how you see that, oh, this person is resilient. Like maybe getting back down in a project and then standing up and figuring out a solution themselves or anything on those lines. Because these words that people talk about that you should be empathetic, these are very ambiguous. Like you should have trust in the team. How do you even see that? How do you see the flare of that from a person when that person comes in? Yeah. Yeah, several stories come to my mind about resilience and things will go wrong and it's how you tackle them. I'm going to take one example of Limango. You mentioned a company there, I worked there in the marketplace. We were scaling up and we missed the point of making our product scalable. So what happened is we were at the point where we had 300 partners advertising products on our website. And we knew that how that worked was not scalable enough. And then in an exchange with a software engineer, we decided to make it better, but we were a little bit reckless. So we didn't do all the proper testing because there was a lot of pressure of making more scalable because we wanted to have 1000 partners by the end of that year. So we needed to accelerate because our products were not being processed. So what happened is we failed. Once we put it live, I got a message from the market team saying, David, you need to stop whatever you are doing because every five minutes, a hundred products go down from our website. And then the, the, the director of market said, actually it's not five minutes anymore. They are just disappearing. And then long story short, 50,000 products went out of of our website and everyone was going nuts with me. So I failed. Yes, that's true. I led to a situation where during two days and in e-commerce with 3 million customers, we removed 50,000 products from the website. What should I do in this case? So I had to be resilient. I had to go there and, you know, I fell down, but I had to stand up and continue. I said, what happened? I cannot change but I can select the answer I'm going to give to that. So I look at the team and said, how do we fix this? I don't want to talk about the past. It's done already. So let's fix this as a team. So we fixed that. And then we said, what do we need to do now to make our products scalable the right way? And then I went to, the, to everyone else. I said, shame on me. Uh, it was my decision to go live. It was not the team's decision. I supported that. So if someone needs to pay the price, it is me but I want to make this right. We still have, it's not a sprint. It is an ultra marathon. I said, I still want to make this right. And then we developed the product in a different way. There was a skip season on my person after this happened. Like, can I really do it? But I knew I could do it. It was a mistake, of course. But that's the thing about being PM. You need to be resilient to this kind of ad adversities you face in life. How do, how do people handle, like, just an offshoot question? It's very hard to handle negative feedback. How do PMs do that? How do good PMs do that? Because if you hear one fine day, somebody, your director is coming and is saying, bro, this is not how it happens. You screwed up, right? How do you own that mistake? How do you develop that kind of attitude? I just want to understand it from you. For me, it came from, from childhood. Uh, my, my father always told me, if you want to grow in life, it is not about the things you acquire. It is not about uh, everything nice you have, how well you're dressed up. It is all about how you treat people and how you treat yourself. And my dad told me once that no one is too good that has nothing to learn. And no one is too bad that has nothing to share. And he said, there will be things in life you are going to do. You are not going to like yourself after that. And people are going to tell you things. But what you need to do as a person is to ask yourself, what can I learn from that? And you should not let the others define who you are. You know who you are and you know who you are not. Try learning from feedback and then make yourself better. Remain humble to listen to the other and knowing that sometimes you're wrong.
yeah yeah that's that's so nice to hear i think one of the things that i keep telling students across and they're from so many different places yeah. is that a lot of times pm good pms have that ability to zoom out and say what is the longer thing which battle do i want to fight in order to win the war and that is so so valuable so i think coming from there and i just want to ask the second question which is also very ambiguous and i asked all of the friends and all, all of the guests who come and i get very varied answers is that the first question that i want to ask is a lot of people underestimate the value of culture or it is very hard to even define culture in the first place right people have varied definitions right so i just want to understand what is a good supportive culture is there a representation of it right and then describing from there right is there a definition of a good product culture or what do you essentially see in that and how does it help people to thrive so i just want you to ponder a little bit upon the importance of culture and then there is a second part to this question a lot of people also ask me this that the culture is very founder led it's very top down right is it true right can a person who joins as an sd or as an apm in a early stage not contribute to the culture well, yeah yeah it's a a very important question to look at and i had the chance of looking from different angles from a P as a pm and now leading the whole company as a ceo and one of the aspects about culture in a leadership position culture is a set of behavior that are accepted in a group so these behaviors they are welcome so people will do more of that. And behaviors that are out of this, they will be rejected. And one of the aspects as a CEO is whatever I tolerate becomes the norm because then it is accepted. So if I want something to be out of the culture, I need to give feedback and I need to make it clear. This is not what I expect and, and so on and encourage the team to do that. Giving you an example, I'm a very hands-on person. Uh, if there is something that makes me panic is when we start talking about the work instead of doing the work, injecting speculation and thinking that going to a meeting room, staying longer in a meeting room, discussing about the product and how the customer is going to use it without even having a customer in the room, this is not going to help. So whenever I see this happening, I say this is analysis paralysis and we need to focus on learning. The faster we learn, the better it will be our product. So that's how I can drive culture. So that is from a leadership perspective. I need to ensure that certain behaviors, they are restrained. And what is good, I give feedback all the time. So someone does a good thing. For example, there was a moment that someone said, hey, I was doubting this is the right thing to do. So I interviewed five customers. Here's what I learned. And I said, that's good. So this kind of thing, I want to see more, this curiosity and not asking for permission, maybe asking for forgiveness. So I keep giving feedback on that. And that, But that's from a leadership perspective. And now looking from PM and elaborating on what is a good culture? A good culture for product, it is a culture that prioritizes learning. So meaning that instead of... Uh, avoiding failure and creating processes and everything to prevent mistakes, it encourages team to use everything that they have to uncover what they don't have. So it is about continuous learning. And the other aspect is a very open communication, being honest to each other. And this is highly important because creating a product is a collaborative game. But if you don't have open communication, it will very quickly become a coordinative game. And that is like uh, throwing things over the fence and say, oh, this is not with me. This is with the UX now. And the UX said, oh, no, 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 no. This is with the software engineer. So that is not open communication anymore. It's coordination. And that is very hard to, to succeed. So we need to have a, a learning uh, culture. We need also to be open with each other and the, and the communication. And we need to be bold. And being bold means like we need to place some bets. And we we know that some of our bets are going to fail. And that's okay. So then it goes back. Let's learn from our failures. But that requires stepping out of our comfort zone, doing something different, connecting this to PM. How can a PM do that? A PM can drive that by doing what is necessary, not what is easy. In many situations I was in, if I go back to 
when I was a senior product manager, my team didn't have a UX designer, but I had doubt that what we were doing was right. Someone had to interview customers. It is not comfortable for me to interview customers. I'm not a researcher. And yet the interview had to take place. So I went out of my comfort zone and to the best of my abilities, I interviewed 10 customers and I learned some things. Uh, I also learned how to improve my interviews, but I did what was necessary. So this kind of taking risks, going out and facing reality, this is quite helpful. So PMs can indeed contribute to the culture. When I arrived in Germany, the team was very focused on the process. And then I started doing things outside the process. And I start asking more questions instead of giving answers. And this started creating a little bit of friction in the beginning, but as the results came, more people started asking me like, uh, how do you get your team to drive those results? And then they start observing and then start changing. And what was in only one team out of 10 started being presented more teams. That's, that's so nice. I always say, tell people that PMs are intelligent bet makers right? We, you're very good bet makers. So I think that's such a nice analogy to kind of shift across by doing and by doing more action than just talking about it. I think one more thing that I just have a very parallel answer to it is that how do you drive autonomy and accountability together, right? Because a lot of times PM scopes are very ambiguous, right? What are you leading? How do you try to do that, that a product manager or for a product leader who reports to you understands the scope of, of his or her work very well. Yeah. That's something I I still figuring out how to define it precisely. It is not black and white, as you said, it's a quite ambiguous. So one of the aspects to me is making it clear what you don't expect. Because if you don't mention what you don't expect, some people assume what is not mentioned, it's expected. Other cultures, we assume the other way. So make it clear first, what you expect and what you don't expect. And then also about, this is about accountability. I expect you to drive results on this. I do not expect you to do this other part. So you solve the accountability, but then it goes to the autonomy. So autonomy, it is something, not everyone knows how to handle that. Yeah. If you tell people how to get somewhere, like, I want you to get here. Some PMs will say, great, let me figure that out. And some PMs will say, I don't even know where to start. And they may get lost into the details in the very first thing to do and they don't get there. So you need to understand the level of autonomy you can give to each person. And then within time, you can leave them like a, to work in a, a kind of a free way, but if you just tell them what to reach without helping them get there, that is going to be hard. And that is a challenge of being a product leader. Nobody is the same. You yeah. need to understand how people tick and what they need to progress. Yeah. I, I really wanted to ask this. I saw your book, Untapping Product Teams, and I really wanted to ask you, what really inspired you? I've been a follower of your content since so long, right? It's very insightful. It's very strategic, right? So I just wanted to understand what's your inspiration. And Janta, if you have not bought David's book, please, it's a personal recommendation from my side. An amazing read, right? So I just wanted to ask, what was your inspiration? What gave you that inspiration to essentially write this book? And what are the messages that you want people to derive from the book? right? At least from an author's perspective, since you're talking here only. So I just want to understand that. Yeah. So this is a book about hope. We can do something when it comes to creating digital products. We can always make something better. And that doesn't need to take long. We can act today for a better tomorrow. So that's the message I want to convey and giving multiple insights. And the question is, why did I decide to write this book? And the reason I decided to write this book is because I am a normal person. Like many other PMs, I work for normal companies that lacked incredible funds that you could fail as many times as you want and you would still remain there and you could try out different things because there would be enough run away for you. I've been part of a game where many times failure, big failure was not an option and I had to figure out how to play the game. I faced challenges 
that many people do face, like stakeholders uh, asking you to deliver everything, output-oriented roadmaps, bloated backlogs, and sales promise, uh, difficult to talk to real customers. So I face all of these throughout my 15 years career of uh, creating digital products. And I realized that more people face exactly this change, uh, this, this challenge. And there are many books telling you how to get to the top and many things, how the Silicon Valley companies work. But the truth is 90% of the PMs do not work for the Silicon Valley companies and they still want to do a better job. And I said, well, I don't own the truth, but I do have a lot of stories that I could give people perspectives and give them hope that they can indeed do something, whatever they are, and they, as a PM, can change the game gradually. That That's such a nice thing. I think writing a book about hope, and I think PMs do need hope because a lot of times it's a very ambiguous role. You're de you deal with failure way more frequently than in generally in compartmentalized IC roles, right? But I want to ask you, and as an offshoot of this question and towards the interest of time, because I want students also to ask you questions. This is the last question that I want to ask you. The first question is that a lot of people make ambiguous choices in life and it is not just product management. It is about choosing the right boss, choosing the right company, right? What should be the ideal switch for me, right? And things like that. And a lot of times the information that they have before making that choice is very less. It's very less. It's either just talking to a manager or maybe talking to a few employees if they get the chance or maybe reading some review online, right? And yet they make choices where they have to spend the next two years, two and a half years in that company spending considerable time. How did you make those choices? Were you always very clear? Were you always very structured? Ki nahi this is the place that I want to go. This is this is very clear to me. And were you like, did you never make poor choices? Right. I, I always ask this question. So how did you decide that next switch, next bet, next ambiguous thing that David wants to do? How did he do it? How did he think about it? I want to just understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I now have a better way of making choices which I didn't have in the past. So let's be vulnerable here. I did have the imposter syndrome. I thought I was not good enough. And I thought if someone is giving me a job, I should, should be grateful and I should get this job and do the best. So that was uh, the story of my life for my first five to seven years career. So if a job opportunity would be presented to me and sound attractive, I would take it. So that's what happened. But then one of the traits I have when I land in a place, no matter the place I landed, I always discovered things that I liked and things I disliked. But what I do is, you know, when you're playing a game, you can look at the cards you have and think about what is the best move I can make right now. And then you just make the best move. Or you can look at the cards you don't have, complain and fold. You don't play the game. That's not me. I prefer doing something because I like trying things out. So that uh, has been the story of my life. Asking, did I make poor choices? Yes, for sure. At one point of my life, I was in a big corporation and I decided to move on because I wanted to experiment with the startup world. Back then, I was a little bit fed up with product. And I said, that's the last chance I'm going to give to a product or I'm going to become an agile coach. I said, I'm going to do something different. And I got an offer for both, but the product came first. And the day I started, I realized it was, it, it was going to be a roller coaster. Uh, and I had signed the contract. Then I got the offer of the agile coach and I was there pondering. I said, what do I do right now? There was high expectations on my role back then and expectations that were unrealistic to a product manager. For example, I was told that uh, I had to ensure that every single software engineer would deliver a minimum of 13 star points, whatever that means. So <laughs> I said, oh my God, I, I'm really trapped here. After that, I created a strategy. To, uh, to understand the companies. And now my strategy is not to find the perfect company. It is to find the battles I am willing to pick. So I like asking questions like this. Can you help me understand how 
a roadmap comes to exist and what it consists. So in this case, I want to understand who prioritized, what is prioritized, who is involved, and what is the commitment level. So if I start seeing output in the roadmap, product managers outside of this process and discussions, teams are involved, I say, that's not a battle for me. I don't want to pick this better anymore. If I see still some output in the roadmap, but the PMs are part of the discussion, I would say that's a battle I can pick. I, it's not that fun, but I can do something about it. Another question I ask is, as a product person, how often do they talk to real customers? And how easy is that to happen? So I want examples about this. And then I will see what happens. And then I ask a very important question. How do you measure success of product managers? And these three questions, they reveal to me the kind of challenge I'm going to face and if I'm up for that. And this will help me understand the direction where I'm, I would land. And I would ask this question to almost everyone in the interview to see how they answer, how consistent that is. And then I would make a choice after that. Makes sense. David, one personal question from my side. How are you so succinct in what you want to say? This is such an amazing trait that PMs should know what needs to be spoken, right? Not because it is because they want people to hear it because it needs to be, right? And how do you build that storytelling narrative? And it's I know it's a slightly parallel question, but how do you generally become a better communicator and a storyteller? I just wanted to understand that, yeah. Three words, practice, practice, practice. But how do I practice is very important, not only the practice. Writing helps me a lot. So I continuously write and then I read that out loud. And then I say too many words. I'm adding noise and not silence. Let's change it. Let's change it. Let's change it. So I love writing because it forced me to step back and then look at the message I want to convey. So this is how I, I do it. So I write a lot. I, I do write I a lot. Do. But Same. not only on LinkedIn. Not only on LinkedIn. I write. No, I, uh, it's not here. I, everybody follows your Substack a lot. Trust me. But before the session, I I think that link was going in the community everywhere. That Do check it out. So I think everybody follows that across. Okay, Janta. In the interest of time, I would want people to start raising hands. I think, Mitali, I'll start with you. Right? So people can start raising hands. They can think of questions they want to, want to ask. I'll just bring Mitali. Yes. Add to spotlight. So again, Mitali, uh, sorry, David, Mitali is joining us from Germany itself. She is in Germany right now. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, David. Please introduce yourself hi. and ask your question. Yes. Yeah. Hi, David. Um, yeah, I'm currently in Berlin, uh, not far away from Munich. So <laughs> we can catch up sometime. Uh, congratulations for your book. First of all, I was going through on Substack and a lot of platforms where it has been introduced. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about one comment that Marty has given because I'm personally a big fan of Marty and his books. He, uh, he said that when product people are not trained to succeed in their jobs, they often make predictable and avoidable mistakes, which very well is covered in your book, like how you can avoid those mistakes. But still what I feel is uh, there. I don't know if there is still a single way to teach product management because even from you and Shravan also, we, we understand that people have to experiment, learn and evolve. So my question is, uh, what do you consider to be essential elements for effectively teaching product managers? And most importantly, what should product managers focus on to maximize their learning and growth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, an interesting question. And going back to your Marty Kagan, when he read my book, uh, it was a bit of a Christmas gift. So I shared the book with him by the end of last year, and he was very nice. And he read the book and said, oh, man, there are so many stories. I just wish that I, you had a chance of working for a great product company. Then you would see things differently. He said, he said, that's the endorsement I can give to you. And then he shared that, what you just mentioned. But the key thing like what I try to convey in the book, I do share many aspects where people can change and what is bad. A simple example, bloated backlog is going to distract you. When you make decisions based on opinions without having evidence, that is going to also get you in trouble sooner or later. When you strive for consensus, you end up with uh, uh, the funniest or the 
the worst possible option that was not even on the table. So things like that. But if you ask, like, how do you teach PMs? It's true. The best way of teaching is experience. But I can tell you that the worst way of teaching PMs is about telling them the frameworks they should follow. Because the frameworks, very quickly, they will become how you work. And then you don't know why you are doing. Then you start asking weird questions like, how do I do product? with Scrum? How do we implement strategy with Kanban? Th th these questions are just wrong. Like it's, how do I drop bad ideas fast enough? That's the question you need to, it's, it's not about doing product discovery. It is about dropping bad ideas. So th these are the kind of things. So how do you teach PMs? Teach them with the principles. So what are the principles we need to follow? And then you can break it down. The chapter 11 of the book is all about product principles. And, and there I share, I just posted today on LinkedIn and a collaboration with Pavel, uh, the, the principles from the book. You can structure principles from strategy, discovery, delivery, and collaboration and say, this is what we need to use as the foundation of our collaboration. That is one way that is quite helpful. Makes sense. Makes sense. I would now bring, just let me just bring Munmun. Yes, adding you to Munmun, over to you, please. David, I have a bias towards calling women first. So you have to deal with those questions first, please. Yeah, yeah, Munmun, go for it. Hi, David. Thank you for giving us your valuable time and insights from your rich experience. I am an ardent fan of your philosophy of keeping things simple. So one of your uh, posts on LinkedIn, I found particularly impactful where you had talked about how a product manager's uh, mindset is their most important tool. And, uh, you know, taking it for talking about dropping bad ideas, you also talked about how removing features creates more value and rather than adding them. So could you elaborate on the criteria you use to decide which features to remove? And then I would like to know, how do you balance the desire for simplicity with the need to cater to evolving user needs. Mm -hmm. It's a good, uh, good point. When I was writing the book, I was thinking a lot about the subtitle of the book. Uh, there, there were things like, how do you simplify what others complicate? The word others was a little bit complicated because it was pointing fingers. But the message I want to say, things get more complicated than they should very quickly. And it's a good skill to simplify this game. When it comes to product features, it is natural that some features, they will stop delivering value at some point in time. It is unnatural to remove these features because we have invested. And as humans, if we invested on something, the only thing we are willing to do after that is to invest more. Because that's how we think. We hate having the feeling of loss. So how do you identify features you would be better removing. There are different ways. The very first one I like doing is a continuous report of feature usage of the last 12 months. That's the very first thing. That can help you understand what users are using. And sometimes you get quite surprised that there are somewhere between 20 and 50%, depending on your strategy and company culture, of features that are not used at all. So I say, every time that you keep this feature, you increase confusion because people will need to go around these features to find what they want to do. That's the first thing. And second, the product becomes harder to maintain because you increase the code base of that. So test coverage and everything. So that is one thing. The other aspect you can do is use heat maps so to see how users interact with your product then you will see that some some things that are just moving around and they are not using at all and you need to make choices why do i say make choices you may have some features that are used by one percent of your users and you say well if one percent is using it brings values to them but are you focusing on your ideal customer profile the, because your product needs to have choices your product needs to serve a specific audience and if I connect to a real product, it was it is one of my favorite because of the authenticity. It's Basecamp by 37 signals. They reject when the customers go big. They say, let the customers outgrow you. So they serve a specific uh, target and they don't go beyond that. 
So they don't blow their product. So user needs are about achieving certain jobs and we continuously improve that. So it can improve how we enable the users to achieve the same job. So that's how some products can grow. That's what I say about simplicity, having clarity on what you are doing and what you are not. Makes sense. I want to also tell, since David mentioned Basecamp, a few years back, around seven, eight years back, when Basecamp, at least that was not, people did not find it that popular initially. I sent an email to Jason, right? And it was a very young, as a very young PM, I wanted to understand that what are the principles that shaped you? And do you know what he did? That is humility. That is how people take feedback. He responded within five minutes. And I got a response and she said, he said that read my book. This is a, this, you will understand a lot about how do you rework. And that is by when I was a fan of Jason since, since then. And since then, Jason has become a, like a big figure. Now everybody tries to follow him for the right reasons. Obviously he's a very good leader, but that's, I think adding to what David's point that basically good product leaders, they are very, very anchored in feedback. They essentially want to drive more and more value to the end customer. Cool. So next I would call. Josefa, I'm calling you. Can you please switch on your camera? That would be super lovely. Yes. yes. Awesome. Am I audible? Josefa, yes, you're audible. Please go for it. Yes. Hey, hi, David. Uh, thank you for your time. And I will not take much of your time again. So I have just a couple of questions starting with. Uh, what are the key, key principles or frameworks you would rely on to guide your project management decisions? The key principles? Yeah. How would so you the guide your decisions? So the principles, uh, they depend on your context for sure. Uh, key principles I have in mind are first to be able to learn, then to scale. What is behind this principle? To hit the market, you need to be as fast as possible. What is the fastest thing you could do to learn? And that means if you are creating a digital product, you should in the beginning deliberately use technical debt because that helps you bring to the market faster. And if something doesn't work, you trash it. And if it works well, you pay the debt off. That's the first principle. First, build to learn and to scale. And another principle I love using is focus on current problems over future problems. What I see happening many times when we are working with teams, we start asking the question, what if that happens? What if this happens? And then we derail from problems that are staring at our face and we start talking about all the problems we don't have and we may never have. So what are the problems we really have? Let's focus on this one, one step at a time, and then we move to the others. So that, th these are simple uh, principles. And another I have, which you could imagine, is simplify whenever you can. So it is like, what is something we could do that would help us remain simple? For example, by remaining simple for me is, which is the process we could just remove it? If we have a workflow, which is the step we could remove it? There's generally in a workflow, something called PO or PM approval. I say, if you have it, just delete it and then thank me later. Because this is where you put the PM in a higher level than the software engineers and you queue collaboration and the PM becomes a bottleneck. So these are a few principles that, that I like following. You can look at my LinkedIn. I just posted today uh, the 12 principles there. So you can have a better ideas on that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. one more thing that I'll tell you simplicity does not mean always a simple workflow it means giving that experience in the simplest possible way and that's why it takes time to design such a thing because you you must have heard that quote very well that anybody can make something complicated it takes a genius to make something simple mm -hmm. right so yeah. that is that is so true so a lot of people confuse simplicity as thinking that it's a very simple flow in terms of steps not necessarily it can be something, but how the value is delivered, that should be quick, fast, easy to understand. And that is something that yeah. I think that is very, very critical. Next, I would want to call Shobit. Shobit, uh, Shobit is a PM at ServiceNow, uh, SPM at CF ServiceNow. Shobit, go for it, please. Yes. Thank you so much, Priya. Hi, David. Thank you so much for this session. Really, really appreciate sharing your experience to add value in our career trajectory. Uh, my question is more narrow towards B2B space. So usually for any PM, the best adrenaline rush is to see all the metrics which they define while creating a product or feature to go live and get the correct feedback on it. Whatever we are serving for customer, they are actually accepting it. 
but in any B2B space, the feedback loop cycle is comparatively very higher in comparison to B2C. So as a PM, I'm seeking a response from you as you are in a leadership position. How should we cater it? Because it's like within a year, we are usually delivering four new features and we are getting feedback for at least two at a gap of six months. So as a PM, how should I take it ahead and uh, still go ahead to look for that aha moment in our careers? Mm -hmm. B2B is a harder game to play in terms of feedback because of the reasons you had some complications that happen. The ones paying the bill are not always the one who will use the product so, but they will be the ones deciding. One of the things that helped me in the B2B, it is about first having clarity on who is your ideal customer profile, who you want to serve. And then as this clarity is established, how can you collect feedback as fast as possible? If you have to launch something to collect feedback, that will be very long. But how could you still collaborate with them and do that? I try finding the customers that I call early adopters. In this case, in the B2B, I found a better name, which is development partner. They love that, at least in Germany. So I say like, I need development partner. And development partner is someone who is willing to invest some time to provide feedback and uh, they will have an influence on the product. So I say, your feedback, will be before it goes to the market and is an opportunity. So I sell that to them as an opportunity to put a dent in the product we are cre creating and this helps. And then we set, uh, I like setting a round of uh, six to 10 of these customers and have frequent exchange with them. The exchange don't need to be long, like one to two hours every two weeks generally will do well and then you can bring different things and then you do it at recurrently. But what is very important is to have the right ones in the round. Because if you miss the mark, you start receiving feedback that is unrelated to what you are trying to achieve. So that is the core. It takes some time to recruit. Sometimes uh, you do need to influence with a compensation, for example, early access to your product or a discount once they sign a contract with you or something. But if you have someone excited, like, as a development partner, which relates in this case to an early adopter, you will benefit from real and honest feedback because they want to use your product. Makes, Makes sense. sense. Makes uh, sense. Just one more question if time allows. Yeah. May I? No, no, yeah. I think in the interest of time, there are other people also. You sure, can sure. drop the question to me. I'll forward it to David. And whenever Make he gets time, he'll try to respond to that. I want to give as many options to speak to David. Yes. Tushar, I'm bringing you in. I'm adding you to the spotlight. Give me a second. Yes. Tushar, over to you. Please, go for it. Uh, hi, good evening, David. Uh, we feel extremely privileged to have you here today. Uh, all of us are aspiring PMs uh, and, you know, uh, you definitely add so much of value to us. Uh, I, in fact, read your 12 product principles and one of my posts was inspired by your 12 product principles. Uh, so thank you for that again. Uh, my question is, uh, how should we deal with the atypical customer conversations? So now that, you know, we are working on our case studies, we are trying to become better product managers. We often speak with customers and there are customers who align with what we want to achieve, right? And there are customers who are at a 180 degree to what we want to achieve. So those are our atypical customers. So how should we deal with those atypical customers? That's the... I would say ambiguity of being a PM. You need to make some decisions on what you want to serve, what do you stand for. I will give you an example about it with my book, actually, because I use product management techniques to write my book. And one of the parts that I did was to have a better reading round for my book. So I had in total six rounds. And each round would have from five to 10 people and they had access to the manuscript. They would provide feedback for the same reason. Someone loves something another person hated. For example, I said that when you try managing stakeholders, the relationship tends to become a kind of, you become the stakeholder puppet. And some people hate the term puppet. So that it's very negative. You are saying that they are bad. They are not always bad. And, uh, I had to make a decision because other person said, 
that is very clear. It is true. I feel like a puppet because the stakeholders are just uh, defining what I'm doing and I, I don't know where I'm going and I do feel like a puppet. And then what was the decision I had to make? Th these were potential cl uh, clients for me, readers who are product managers. And there was no single thing I could do to please both of them. If you think about, if you try, let's meet in the middle, then we go to consensus. It is one of the things I shared there in the beginning, which consensus, you create a, an option that is not good for anyone, but everyone likes because we discuss a lot about it. So let's move on. What a good PM would do? Let's step back and say, like, what do I stand for? I stand for plain talk, honesty, and I stand for unconventional product management. I said, I'm not going to sugarcoat here. Because when I was a PM, I did feel like a puppet. And more PMs feel like a puppet. I'm going to go with this one, knowing that some people are not going to like it. Make to myself, when you are creating a product, you need to remain true to your value proposition. Your product has a value proposition. Anchor your decisions on that. Makes sense. I think Thank you so much. one more point that I would want to add, Tushar, I think what David said is phenomenal, that being honest and true to your value system is very important. That's one. But I think there is one more thing that I would say whenever you have do hard conversations, I think people are afraid of disagreements a lot. So a lot of times when you start a hard conversation, the first thing is to come to a point of consensus and see where do you think that this idea makes sense and tell them that it would have in this context, it would have made sense. But let me show you another perspective that this is how I think about it. So I think agreement and then putting your point across is a very good way to have hard conversations because it makes the person feel validated also. Yeah. Makes sense. I'll bring across. Nadisha, I'm bringing you across. Yes. Give me a second. So David Nadisha is joining us from Ireland. Yes. So Nadisha. Thank you so much, Shabin. Uh, thank you so much, David. I'm one of them who just raised my hand last minute. So I'm really sorry for the other three. Apologies. I'm going to make it very quick, David. Um, I just heard that you have some experience as an agile coach. You've worked as an agile coach and I had just checked your profile to yeah. confirm. So you do have, I am an agile coach and I've worked as a scrum master. I just want to know what were some of the common skills you find between Scrum Master and Agile Coach, because I want to transition into a product management, project management. So what do you think uh, A is common and B, what is it that I should start developing more? Are they really two different sides of the same coin or they're just separately two different coins altogether as per you? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shavin and David. Sure. Yeah, this is highly related to the how you played the role of Agile Coach or Scrum Master because there are different ways. So one of the things that I did, which I'm not so proud of, I used to try lecturing people on methods. And this is something I decided to leave in the past because it didn't help that much. What helped me was another skill I developed on the way, which is the skill of listening. And this listening combined to reading what is happening in the room. So this ability of reading what is happening in the room helps you meet your audience where they are, not where you want them to be. And this helps quite a lot because then you can say, what is the one thing I could bring to the game right now? What I say that Agile Codes would have in common with product people is a vast toolbox. So you will know many methods. Product managers will know many frameworks. But the key thing is knowing what to use when. And it's not about to starting using a framework because the framework is cool, but it is knowing this framework would help in this situation because that would help the team progress a little bit. So that is a core skill, reading the room and knowing which tool to use when. Yeah, makes Thanks, sense. David, I agree. Makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. I will now bring Akash. I'm bringing you in. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Akash. Maya. Uh, thanks, Over David, for your time. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, so uh, with ever changing, you know, landscape of products and technology um, and more due to uh, AI and introduction of other technologies, how do you stay on top of things? And what are your tips that you would like to give us to, you know, stay relevant to the market and upgrade ourselves? Good. So I consider myself as an internal student. I'm always learning. And that has been true for a while. I don't envision to be better than anyone else but who I was the day before. 
So I always try, and it's this is not just a cliche. I try finding new ways of acquiring knowledge. And one of the ways I do is a simple way. I read books. I listen to audiobooks. I listen to podcasts. Uh, that's, that's one of the things I do for, for, for learning. I read around, it depends on the year, but uh, 40 to 50 books a year. I do attend to new courses and I exchange a lot. I network with people. And one thing, if I give give one tip is, if you want to become a product manager and you are not, get closer to someone who is two, three years on the road. This person's gonna help you with perspectives, are fresh. When I wanted to write my book, I didn't get close to Mark Kagan who wrote already three books. I shared with him my manuscript once it was done, but I got close with Martin Dauman and Stefan Wolpers who had just released the book. And then they shared with me everything that I should know about the traps of writing a book, where I should pay particular attention. So find someone who knows uh, what you want to do and get close to them. And you will be surprised. When you ask for help, people are willing to help. And you just need to make peace with one thing. Ask many people, you just need one yes, just one yes. And someone is going to give that. Some people are not going to give you the answer. Some people are going to ignore your message. Make peace with that. Some people are going to give you a no. You had a no already before you even said it. And one person is going to give you the yes. I wanted to have in my book 10 recommendations before publishing. I sent message to 30 people and I got a yes of 15 people. The others either rejected or never replied to me. It's okay. I made peace with that. Makes sense. Makes such a valuable thought. I think that is the same thing that I keep telling you. It's getting into what good place. That one right boss, that one right person. Your life is type of a discovery only, right? But whatever you do in product management, your life is like that only because you are making choices day in, day out, day in, day out, right? So makes sense. Such a powerful advice. Very nice. Next, I want to call Mayank. Mayank, I'm bringing you in. Yes. Just a second. Go for it, Mayank. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, David, for your new book. And, uh, you know, I already using a couple of your templates, uh, uh, which already on the Myra verse. And I really like this assumption matrix and customer interview preparation. And talking about the, uh, you know, the question which I have, because I'm transitioning from uh, project manager to this product manager and I associated with the telecom, uh, which is again a German company. And uh, uh, so my question is that, what do you see the most significant trend in product management area that we as a uh, aspiring uh, product manager need to prepare and upscale ourselves? The biggest trend we have right now is how to combine AI, like what we can do with that, what we can delegate. AI is a solution. I don't think is what is going to make a game changer. But for me, it's like a, we are facing a moment I call it as a reset moment. We are loaded now with choices. We have many options. We have many agile frameworks and we have many frameworks for product managers. Product managers who are going to stand out for me are those who have a mindset that will help teams drive value and are those who will ask the right questions, not the ones who will provide the right answers, but I will help foster collaboration. So developing the communication, it is something fundamental. And they start telling. Because one thing that shocks me, I give a cohort and I also give lessons in different places. Sometimes... I ask people like to present what they created. There are 50 people in the room sometimes and they don't want to present. They don't want to present. So that's something AI is not going to solve for you. Communication is something that product managers still need to help and develop. If you are a good storyteller and people listen to what you say, that is going to help you stand out. Makes sense. Makes That's so amazing. Next, I want to call Nikhil. I'm bringing you in. Yes. And... Uh... I'm just, go for it, Nikhil. Yes. Great. So David, you know, great hearing from you. Uh, Nikhil, your voice is a little, uh, it has a lot, lot of echo. Would it be possible for you to kind of make it slightly clearer? Yeah. Is yeah. it better now? Is it? It's better now. It's better now. Go for okay. it. Okay. Great, great. So David, uh, you know, what Sharon said, uh, and 
you shared about uh, how to be succinct about your thoughts and uh, how to continue to learn. I think when when we go through this journey of uh, uh, progress, we continue to explore ways in which we could improve and we could drive success in a personal manner. I, the question I wanted to ask you is, uh, when you're working in uh, an environment or an organization where you have to drive success, the success comes through a team. Now the team, however, is not a team that you can always choose yourself. You get a team which may be uh, at par with the level of output that is needed, or they may not be there yet. They may be at a stage where they need uh, twice the time or let's say you know, twice the skills. The individuals may not be skilled enough. So do you have any experiences or do you have any thoughts around how to get the best output when you know your team lacks the definite skills that are required? Any tips, tricks, or you know, any thoughts? I think I, think, I, think I want to rephrase this question and this person that you want to listen. How do you empower teams, David? How do you essentially go inside in a room where everybody's bickering, probably not the right culture? How do you set the tone straight and tell people to believe in their abilities? I just want to understand that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a challenging thing, but it's doable. So you may arrive in an environment where the team is unskilled or unprepared. The question you need to understand first is, do they have the right mission? Do they understand why do they go to work? Of course, you need to be transparent. So the very first thing, I give the benefit of the doubt. And the benefit of the doubt is I need to do my job. What is my job? It's to arrive there and put people on a mission. When I worked for a company in Brazil trying to help car owners sell their cars in less than an hour, connecting with car dealers, I went there, the developers were quite demotivated and I didn't understand. Everyone was complaining, saying, yeah, they are not good. They don't get it. They don't get it. And I went and to, to talk to them. They were in another country. That was the first thing. And I asked them, what do you do at work? And all of them told me the same thing. I code. So they received tickets and I code. I said, what do you code for? And I said, whatever you choose, man, you are the PM. So that's what they told me. I said, all right, let's understand what we're doing here. I said, we come to work because selling cars in Brazil sucks and we want to change this game. We are not here to code. We are here to disrupt the second hand car market in Brazil. Are you up for that? I'm going to lead you on that. I, I will take the lead. I take the flag. I will do what it takes, but I need your help to keep this in mind, disrupting the second hand car market. Just this conversation changed the drive. The team starts challenging me. They would say, hey, David, how does this thing help the guy sell the car faster? How does this thing help them? They start asking questions differently. They move away from, hey, give me the ticket. I want to code. Give me the ticket. I don't have tickets. They start, give me the problem. I don't have problems to solve anymore. So it is about putting the team on a mission. And even if you do that and you realize that some people just don't go on the mission then you use the power of feedback and you say i miss you in the team i am not feeling your energy i am missing your drive is there anything i could do to support try being supportive is there anything to do that and then if still doesn't work then you talk to the team lead and still doesn't work then you talk again it still doesn't work then you are transparent and say now we need to evaluate options so try giving the first, be supportive, putting on a mission, try giving feedback. And if it doesn't work, it's true that some people are not up for this kind of challenge. And then you need to decide what to do because what you tolerate becomes the norm. Makes sense. Uh, David, can we all spend five to 10 more minutes? That would be just lovely. Just Yeah, uh, we can do it. Yes. Tejas, I'm adding you to the call. Tejas, over to you. Please go yeah, for it. Thanks, uh, thanks, David, for being here. And uh, thanks, Shavan, for the opportunity. My question is uh, more on uh, the execution part of the product, right? Uh, so for product-focused companies, it is quite easy that uh, we do the discovery and then we get into uh, the delivery mode of it. Uh, if we have to bring in the product mindset for the service-level industries, right? How do we encourage uh, uh, you know teams to move from project mindset to the product mindset? Uh, do you want to give any one pragmatic uh, approach that has helped you do this? 
So one thing is about moving away from processes. Uh, when I hear product discovery and then we move to product delivery, that is already quite related to processes. And when it comes to services, the tip I have is pragmatic. Pragmatic and facing reality. I've been part of the service industry. I also offer some service. I do some workshop with companies and so on. And when companies ask me, like, can I see like a your offer template or something like that. I simply don't have it. So I have a conversation with them and I ask like, what do you want to achieve? Let's say I give you one workshop of one day. What is the thing you want to be able to do at the end of that day? Or what is the thing you don't want to see in your team again? And then we have a conversation and I say, yes, I can do it or no, I cannot do it. And I say, I be transparent. Uh, there are things I cannot solve. So the service industry, it is one of the industries where the knowledge and the value comes from people. And the value it is about enabling the others to do something. So start with that and be transparent and uh, move away from the contract negotiation. So that is one thing that I, I uh, see quite supportive uh, and that can help. Makes sense. I think there's just one point that I want every and I want everybody to write, and that is what David also said, is that people don't work for you, they work for themselves. The story has to tell them that what is why is it valuable to them? Even in a service industry, if you can tell that by doing this, there's an outcome that is valuable to the company that will be achieved, and it is very succinct and you scope it out very well. I think nobody says no to more revenue, or nobody says no to faster tax. Right. That is something that you have to put across very upfront in a very clear manner. And I think that's where people will essentially move across. Awesome. Yes. Last thing, David, I have a personal question for you. How do you become a good person? How do you, what are the traits of a good person? I just want, and I know it's very philosophical, but I just wanted to ask it because I have the last few minutes with you. So I just wanted to understand how do you see that a person is a good person? Yeah. You need to be in peace with yourself, whoever you are. And, you know, it's about reflecting. We make mistakes. That's the truth. And uh, one of the things I like doing continuously, it is reflecting on who am I and who am I not? So I perceive myself as a good person, an honest person. I am a person who love my wife. I love my family. And, and then I reflect on what am I doing to make that happen? I look at my notes and say, am I giving time to my family? And I'm giving time to my wife. Am I giving time to people on LinkedIn? And I am a hopeful and optimistic person. So these are things that I have with me. So I try reflecting on what I'm doing that helps that. These I want to do more. And I reflect on, ah, these are things that are hurting that. And, you know, I failed also. So I say, let's start not doing that anymore so it is about doing that and asking for feedback so you can ask for feedback some people will be resistant to give it but your friends will give it to you you can say hey, we have been going out for a while tell me something that you believe i could do differently something i could do better and then you learn and feedback is a present and as a present you can always decide if you're going to use it or you're going to set it apart Makes sense. So David, we have this culture of taking a photograph with the entire cohort. I want everybody to showcase your faces. Please, Avneet, Mayang, Harshit, this has this is a happy photograph, right? The most ugly person in the call is me. So if I'm showing my face, I think everybody should, right? So please, at the count of three, we do like this and it's a cheese. One, two, three, cheese. Once again, awesome. So David, once again, thank you very much, David. This means a lot. I think everybody took away so much from this. Your demeanor, the way you act, there's absolutely so much to take away from this. I'm super, super grateful for your time. I think people loved it and they have tons and tons of questions. Janta, as gratitude for the speaker, two, three things I want from you. One, feedback on Slack, which I want to send across to David ASAP. And he consistently spoke about feedback. So ask feedback, dena hai. that's one. The second thing, 1,000 followers at least should go, go increase, Nayar. It makes sense. At least there should be 20, 30 mentions. Bare minimum, right? Itta to banda hai. He, he spent so much time, gave us so much valuable advice. Once again, David, this is super, super helpful. The, I think this conversation will also go on YouTube and a few other places. And I think 
once again congratulations so much on your book personally looking to read it deeply and take a lot of value from it and we'll do this again at for sure makes sense thank you very much bye bye thank you thanks a lot bye 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 take care